There are many different types of solutions. Aqueous solutions are probably the most common. In an aqueous solution, water is the solvent. The solute can be um, a gas, a liquid, or a solid. So any of those combinations. But anytime you have an aqueous solution, water is always the solvent. Um, when we, f we refer to solubility, that is actually a quantitative measurement of the amount of substance that will dissolve in a given amount of solute. That's wrong, solvent. A given amount of solvent. So often that's expressed as grams of solute per 100 grams of solvent. So 36 grams of sodium chloride per 100 grams of water. Here are different types of solutions. Um, we tend to think of solutions as having a liquid solvent with some solute dissolved in them. But you can also have gas solutions where the solvent and the solute are gases. Air is a gas solution. It's a homogeneous mixture of two or more compounds. Yes? Um, it's implying the maximum amount, yeah. You can also have solid solutions. Um, you can have a solid dissolved in a solid. That seems a little strange. But alloys are solid solutions. Brass is not an element. It's not a compound either. Neither is stainless steel or um, um, sterling silver or like 24 karat gold is not pure gold. It's a mixture of gold with other metals. And so we have, like brass is copper and zinc mixed together homogeneously. Energy is a driving force for many things in nature. Many physical systems tend toward lower potential energy. We think of a, a boulder rolling down a hill. It's going down to lower its potential energy. And we might be tempted to think that that is the driving force be behind mixing of, of substances. And yet it is not. Formation of a solution sometimes lowers the potential energy, but doesn't always. If we think about two noble gases, or two ideal gases here, neon and argon, we have a box and they're separated by a partition. When we remove that partition, the particles are going to mix. We understand that. These gas particles move in a straight line until they bump off of something, and so they're going to mix together. Does that lower their potential energy? No, it doesn't. Because an ideal gas is not experiencing any interactions with the other particles. So the, the argon atom in this separated container and the argon atom in this container are experiencing exactly the same thing. They feel like they're completely alone in the universe. They're not interacting with anything. Mixing the two gases together does nothing to their potential energy. So potential energy is not a driving force for mixing. <coughs> the driving force is something called entropy. One way to define entropy is a measure of energy randomization or energy dispersal in a system. What's happening with those ideal gases is that the kinetic energy of each gas becomes spread out or dispersed over a larger volume, and that results in an increase in entropy. Entropy always wants to increase. Another way to think of it is a measure of disorder. My house is a demonstration of the tendency of entropy to increase. Disorder reigns unless you exert a lot of energy to make things ordered. Um, leaves falling off of a tree, they're very ordered on the tree, right? They're, the end of the leaf is the same and it's attached to the, to the stems. In the fall, when the leaves come down, they, they blow all over the place. They're very disordered. That's an increase in entropy. So we can think of it as an increase in disorder, but at the heart of it is a, a dispersal of energy. Energy tends to spread out. 
So substances mix because of this tendency for energy to spread out whenever it is not restrained from doing so. Entropy also explains thermal energy flowing from hot objects to cold ones. If you put an ice cube in a cup of hot tea, the energy flows from the hot tea into the ice cube. You don't ever see a cup of tea just spontaneously grow an ice cube in the middle, right? Have you ever seen that happen? It just doesn't happen because that would be concentrating energy as opposed to it dispersing and it just naturally spreads out. Intermolecular forces are very much involved in solutions. Um, they may assist or promote the formation of a solution or may, they may prevent the formation of a solution. Here's just a quick review of the different intermolecular forces. We have the dispersion forces between all substances have dispersion forces. For nonpolar species, this is the only intermolecular force they have. We have dipole-dipole forces between polar molecules. We have hydrogen bonding between polar molecules that have fluorine, oxygen, nitrogen bonded to hydrogen, ET phone home. And then we have ion dipole forces between ions and polar molecules. And so these are very important in the formation of solutions. Intermolecular forces exist between the solvent and the solute particles. So here we have um, the blue ellipses are the solvent molecules and the little red spheres are the solute molecules. So there are interactions between the solvent and the solute. There are also interactions between the solvent particles with themselves. And there are interactions between the solute particles. So solute to solute. So there's three different categories of interactions going on here. And the relative strengths and types of them is what determines whether a solution forms or not. So if the solvent-solute interactions are greater than the interactions between the solvent particles and between the solute particles, then a solution will form. Because in order for these things to mix and form a solution, we have to disrupt the attractions between the solute particles and disrupt the interactions between the solvent molecules and replace them with interactions between the solvent and the solute. If the solute-solvent interactions are strong, then that's energetically favorable. If the solvent-solute interactions are about the same strength as the interactions between solvent molecules and between solute molecules, the solution will form. Here, energy is not a driving force, but an increase in entropy, a spread of energy, will drive that to happen. If the solvent-solute interactions are much weaker than the interactions between the solvent molecules themselves and between the solute molecules themselves, then that gain in entropy doesn't make up for the loss in energy, and a solution does not form. So let's determine whether each of these compounds is soluble in hexane. You might say, well, what is hexane? This is hexane. Hexane is six carbons in a line, all single bonds, and their octets are made up by bonding with hydrogen. Does that look like a polar molecule or a nonpolar molecule? Does it look symmetrical? Yeah, it's very symmetrical. And in fact, carbon and hydrogen are so close in electronegativity that their bonds are considered nonpolar bonds. <coughs> so here we have the solute, I'm sorry, the solvent, hexane. This is nonpolar. What kind of intermolecular forces does it have? Dispersion forces. It only has dispersion forces, those instantaneous dipoles that induce a dipole in the neighboring molecule. They come and they go 
very weak. So the interactions of hexane molecules with hexane molecules are very weak. Now we're looking at water. Is water polar or nonpolar? You should know that water is polar. It's a very important aspect of it. If we look at this, we see the central atom has lone pairs. Bingo, it's a polar molecule. Water has hydrogen bonding because we have oxygen bonded to hydrogen in a polar molecule. So we have hydrogen bonding, very strong intermolecular force. Now, water does experience an attraction to hexane, but that attraction is only the dispersion force. Water has dispersion forces. All, all things have dispersion forces. Hexane only has dispersion forces. But the interaction of water molecules with other water molecules are hydrogen bonding. That's very strong. So the interaction between the hexane and the water is going to be very weak compared to the interaction that the water has with itself. So will a solution form? No. So water is not soluble in hexane. So that's sort of the, the reasoning behind it. The shortcut is like dissolves like. So we look at the hexane and we say, well, it's nonpolar, only has dispersion forces. Water is polar. It's got dipole-dipole forces and hydrogen bonds. These are not alike. A solution will most likely not form. Let's look at ammonia. Ammonia and hexane. Is ammonia polar? There's its Lewis structure. Is that polar? Yeah, it's polar. Does it have hydrogen bonding? ET phone home, F-O-N-H. We've got nitrogen and hydrogen. This has hydrogen bonding. Is ammonia going to dissolve in hexane? No. They are not alike. The ammonia molecules are very strongly att attracted to each other, much more strongly than they are attracted to the hexane. So the ammonia molecules are like a clique of girls in high school, right? And they are just so into each other that you can't get in. They just exclude everybody else. How about propane? Here's the um, chemical formula for propane. What do you think? Is that polar or nonpolar? Nonpolar. So this is nonpolar, and that's nonpolar. Are those alike? Yeah. I didn't answer this one. Not. So this will be soluble. How about hydrogen chloride? HCO. Polar or nonpolar? Polar. There's only one bond. It's a polar bond, and so the whole molecule's polar. Polar versus nonpolar, soluble or not? Not. You got the idea? 